you want to learn about the many different ministers we have here at Crossfire? Do you want to know what's actually going on here? You want to listen to some great sermons and even watch them too? Have you ever wondered what we believe or what our visions are? Well, we can tell you. Come visit our website at www.mycrossfire.com. Hey there, men of Crossfire. It's that time of year again as we prepare for our annual man camp. This year, our man camp will have a special guest speaker all the way from San Antonio, Texas, Pastor Warren Beamer from the Healing Place Church. We're excited to have Pastor Beamer come in and pour into our men and help iron sharpen iron as the men of Crossfire come together for a weekend to build one another up and fulfill our calls and our roles as men in our household and in our church. Registration is now open online, so visit our website at www.mycrossfire.com for more information. This fun-filled weekend will have plenty of games, activities, and time for fellowship. We'll spend time at the shooting range, playing golf, just hanging out with one another, card games, you name it, we can do it. But most of all, we are going to dive into the Word of God as men of honor. So I invite you all again, please take the time, sign up online, get registered. The first 20 guests registered will receive a special prize. I look forward to seeing you all at this year's Men of Honor Man Camp. The purpose of home groups is to provide and promote fellowship opportunities within the community of God. At Crossfire, we desire that no one feels left out or forgotten. Home groups are a great way for us to connect with other people in the church to meet each other's needs as we grow in the Lord. For more information about our home fellowship groups, pick up a flyer in the foyer. Hey Crossfire, now would be a good time to check in on Facebook and let your friends and family know that you're here at Crossfire. And please, don't forget to silence your cell phone. Welcome to Crossfire, where we learn, live, and give the gospel together. Crossfire World Outreach Ministries is... ...same way we're called to do the same thing, to kind of just stop life and go spend time with Dad. So if you're a man and you're interested in coming to our man camp, please fill this out. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe they can go online too, go online too, and fill it out as well. Um, I'll be honest; I'm a bad offender, so I'll, I will fill it out after service online. Uh, so my head count will be there, um, and it's just not assumed that, I, that I'm there. Um, the other thing is, is that tonight, everyone say tonight, is home groups. So uh, I would encourage you find a home group. I have uh, mine starts at 6:30. I live off of Elderberry Loop, kind of in the Thurston area. Uh, Brother Gordon runs off, runs, runs one, runs one <laughs> off of 32nd, off of Douglas area. Um, and then Phyllis's and Phyllis and Linda's, they normally start at 5, 5.30. They're actually just canceled, right? Oh, they're actually doing it? Praise God. It's still... Chambers, cool. Cool. And it's not what I heard a couple of days ago, but that, hey, God's still doing stuff. Amen. Um, but I would encourage you to find one. Um, I got, I made pizza yesterday day for, uh, for dinner, or actually my wife did. I made pasta uh, and a pasta salad. So we're probably having pizza tonight at my house. Um, but come on, hang out. We're going to talk about Jesus. Um, and uh, it, we really believe in being the body. I think that's the most important thing unity in the body. Amen. Um, I encourage you, please, please, please f uh, get involved with the thing that's going on here. God's doing some awesome, awesome stuff. Now, my friend, my brother, Bishop Anthony Hopper. <laughs> Who says things like that? I do. Let me pray for you. All right. God, we just thank you so much for this word that Anthony has. It's going to be good. Lord, Lord, I, I know that uh, I know that you have plans and dreams and hopes for us, but Lord, I pray that you would open up our ears, that you would open up our eyes and open up our spirit to receive the words that are coming from your throne room through Anthony. Lord, we love you and we worship you. We thank you so much that we are going to be changed and transformed today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So he forgot to mention one of the home groups. Yeah, yeah. 
There's one in Eugene, on Echo Hollow, at my house. You're all welcome, or not, it's okay. Good morning. I missed you guys, it's kind of good to be home. I still call this my home in some ways because this is the first church I attended in Oregon, but in this building. But on the way here this morning, I mean, we're going to talk about transformation. We're just going to get it out of the way. We're going to have some fun this morning, but we're going to be real serious because there is, there is things missing in our walk with God that, that I don't even think that we realize. But I want to personally believe that God has a great sense of humor because he built me and I have a very weird sense of humor. So his must be amazing if he can understand mine, right? So we're going to move with that. But on the way here this morning, have you ever been on the freeway and, and you're driving in the left lane and there's people who just don't have a clue what the left lane means? It's like, it's the fast lane. It's like, I bind the spirit in Jesus' name of slow driving in the left lane. And then just about the time you're ready to go and so you move to the right lane to go around them, they move over. I was like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Now, now you're going to move over, cool. So you get back in the left lane, and it's like they're watching their mirror like, I don't want to be in your way. So they jump back in the left lane. It's like, what is wrong with you? Why are you even on this planet? <sighs> People were inconsistent. And it was funny because inconsistency was one of the things that I was thinking about. And even driving over here, I realized, and I just thought, man, these people are inconsistent. And when we think of transformation... We're going to look at two different parts today. It's an inward transformation, which has been preached on a million times, the transformation of the mind. And we're, we're, going to, we're going to spend some time there. We're going to spend a lot of time there. And then we're going to look at the outward change, the outward transformation that needs to accompany it for transformation to be complete. Because transformation in itself, we got to understand that it, it is a word that means to, to be changed to a, a point where you can't go back. And that's what we want to do. We want to change. We want to, we want to develop a life in Christ to the point where we can't go back. Not just so we don't want to go back. I don't want to get up in the morning, but I have to anyway. I don't want to go to work sometimes, but I have to anyway. I don't want to shave, so I quit. Um, <laughs> certain things you can't quit. Um, see, transformation, never going back. Never going back. So the inward change, that's, if you're taking notes, it's going to be the first thing we're talking about, the inward change. What does your stream of consciousness sound like? What does the, the river running through your head sound like? There are words floating through, through our heads at all times. Some are good and purposeful. Some are not. I mean, I'll be the first to admit my, my mental daily monologue is... It's quite the peaks and valleys, and sometimes it becomes very self-focused. It becomes very, very self-centered and, and very truthful. Even when we become self-focused and self-centered, far too often our inner dialogue, our stream of consciousness, babbles like a defeating brook. It's very self-defeating. I mean, how many of us have, have been there where we're like, man, wow, that was a stupid thing to say. I thought that like 30 seconds ago when I told the story about driving here trying to run over someone. I thought, man, that was a stupid thing to say. You're mad at your wife. She's not picking up her phone. She's not answering. She, you know, she leaves you on red for those younger people. And I don't know. She ignored me. It's a good idea, but somebody else probably won't think so. I really want to do this, but I don't know if I can pull it off. The list goes on, it goes on, it goes on, how often we talk ourselves out of things, how often the self-defeating we are. That's not even the negativity part. That's just the self-defeating. That's just the, I want to accomplish, but I can't because I'm going to stay in here. Sometimes our minds need a refresher. There's a study, and I'm not a scientist at all. So I don't know how true it is, but we're going to go with it this morning. And if it's wrong, then I'm sorry, but it sounds good. So we're going to roll with it, and it makes sense. And I believe it was done at Harvard, and they're smarter than I am there, most of them. Um, first, let's back up. How many in here would say, 
I need change in my life. I need change. I need to change my mind. I need to change what I'm doing. I need to change how I view things. I need to change how I'm viewed. You know why that's so hard to accomplish? Because the same very study that I was telling you about, it tells us that from the ages of zero to four, zero to four, 50% of your cognitive programming is completed. From the ages of five to eight, 30% more is completed. And from the age of nine to 18, another 15%. I went to public school, but I know that's 95%. That means from the time that, for, that from your birth until you are 18, when you're finally able to make decisions on your own, 95% of who you are has already been put into you by your environment, by your parents, how you were raised, what you saw on TV, the things you took in. 95% of your programming is made for you. And you know what? For some of us, that's scary. For some of us, we were put behind the eight ball before we ever knew we were playing a game. We get set back from an early age and we don't know what to do because we have 95% of our cognitive programming that all of a sudden, here I am 25 years old, I wanna have this wife, I wanna do it right, I wanna love God, I wanna follow Jesus, I want, I want to proclaim his name, I want to be everything I can be, but there's so much of me that's still stuck over here and I just don't understand why. Well, first we have to understand why. Why? Because of the things that happened to you, that were given to you, that were shown to you, that were taught to you from the time you were born until the time you were 18 years old, they have become almost all of who you are. We're going to look in Romans chapter 8. It starts off in verse 1. It says, there is, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He condemned the sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to a flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the things of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the things of the Spirit is life and peace. Most of us have heard that before. We understand it's about our mind is no longer thinking of these earthly things. We're going to think of heavenly things. And we're going to set our mind away from the earth, away from the worldly things, and we're going to set our mind into a spiritual realm. I want us to understand the meaning of the word realm. The true definition of the word realm is anything you can reach with your influence. You know, the, the, the Roman Empire the realms that they speak of in medieval times and things like that, it was not limited by physical borders. It didn't look like a map, but weird shaped states like ours does, you know. Who drew that, by the way? Sorry. Have you ever looked at a map and wondered why? <laughs> Looks like a three-year-old with an Etch-a-Sketch -Etch went to town and said, hey, here you go, here's your country. Realms did not have borders like that. Realms were as far as the king's influence would reach. That was their realm. It extended over oceans. It extended across vast portions of land. So when we want to set our mind on a spiritual realm, there is not a confined, defined space that we are looking for. We want to set our mind above. We're going to change some terminology to bring a better understanding. Instead of setting your mind on a spiritual realm, well, that's so vast. Where do I look in this realm? It's huge. I don't know, but let's set it above. Let's set it apart from the world. Let's take it from here and let's put it here. We read forward. In verse 12, it says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have the, received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. I want to look back. 
in verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. So what that's telling us is when, when, when we have a mind transformation, when we give our heart and soul and our mind is transformed and we're like, I'm going to follow Jesus, the word tells us, guess what? You don't have to fall back to slavery anymore. You don't have to go back. Because it's a change, it's not a transformation. We asked earlier who wanted to change. At some point, almost everybody's hand went up. I challenge you this morning that we don't want to change. We want to transform. We don't want to just change. You can go and change clothes. But you can still go back later and put the same ones you're wearing right now back on. But if you transform your wardrobe... If you take everything, if you take the t-shirts and jeans and you get rid of them and you go buy a closet full of suits, guess what? You're only going to wear suits from now on unless you decide to transform again. Transformation is not a destination. It's an ongoing process. Transformation is never complete because where I need to be today, once I'm there, I need to be somewhere else. I don't need to stop there. We don't need to stop. When you get to one level, you don't just, when you're climbing a flight of stairs, you don't get halfway up and be like, oh, that's close enough. Unless you're at Matthew Knight Arena, and then you're like, man, I'll just listen to the game because these stairs, they're gum. Sorry. Oh, I had a chance to go to a basketball game with, with Candace and Daniel last night, and I did not realize. I, I thought I was going to be healthy because I was carrying a plate of nachos and a soda. I was like, well, I need to burn a few calories. I'm going to take the stairs to the second level because in my head, when you take a flight of stairs somewhere, if I'm going from level one to level two, that's one, maybe two flights of stairs if they double back. No, not at Matthew Knight. They do common core stairs there. It's like eight flights to get to the top. It's dumb. Sorry. But our transformation, it's not a set destination. Don't get so caught up that you get one point and you're like, once I get there, I got it made. Once I get here, I'll be good. For a minute, you will. But then you need to prepare yourself for the next transformation. There's another step. There's another step. When I found this, it was, it was kind of cool. It starts off as a square. Well, then it went to there. And I know that you can put these back, so this is a horrible representation, but we're going to pretend like it's glued every time it goes there so it can't go back. Ha. Huh. Um, so you get to the second one and it's glued there. Now it can't go back to this one. Plus it changed colors. Can't go back to being blue. Now it's blue and green. But that's not, it's not its final spot. And each step, it has another purpose. It has another purpose. It has another purpose. There is another step in transformation. There's five steps that we need to take to transform our mind, and we're going we're gonna to look at these really quick. The first one is, is pretty simple. We need to ask the Lord to guard and direct your mind. You want to transform the mind? Put somebody in charge of it who knows what they're doing, because we don't. Our mind is a place of our intellect, our reasoning, our intentions. That's what all this does. So you know what this controls? Our behavior. And so this is where spiritual transformation begins. Romans 12, 2. I'll start in 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If you've been to church more than twice, you've probably heard Romans 12, 2. The object of our regular thinking will determine how this week plays out, how next week plays out, how next month plays out. It is going to guide our steps as we go. One of my favorite Bible verses, Proverbs 16, 9. A man will choose his path, but the Lord will guide his steps. My mind can choose my path, but please let the Lord guide my steps. Too often we don't ask for the Lord's protection and direction or oversight of our mind. We give him control of other things like that power bill that's due. We want to throw that one at him. That disobedient wife or husband, 
a broken marriage, a messed up relationship, an addiction. We'll throw all those things at him. But our mind, our will, our emotions, kind of hold that one close to the vest. Pretty simple. To ask the Lord to guide your heart and direct your mind. Start your, start your day with a, sim, with a simple prayer. Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, keep my mind firmly set where you want it to be. Keep my heart focused on what you have for me today. And Lord, guide my steps. It's pretty simple. But we pray daily. Step two. We recognize the source of our self-focused and self-defeating thoughts. Given that our behavior begins in our mind, and our mind is where our spiritual transformation begins, it can't really surprise us that the enemy wants to mess with our minds. How many of you have had that moment where you're sitting around and you're like, man, the devil's doing his duty in my head today. He is there. He's just got my thoughts all over the place. I can't focus. I'm negative. Am I the only one who's ever recognized that happening here? Just me? Okay. I guess so, but that's cool. But he messes with my head sometimes. I'll tell you what, I've experienced times of, of mental oppression. I won't call it depression, but oppression. Being held down. It feels heavy, it's like physically heavy sometimes. bad part is most of the time when we get in that moment, we don't realize that we're engaged in a spiritual battle. We're not, we're not fighting things of this world. But we try to combat it with things of this world. We can't fight a spiritual battle with physical things. We can't immediately free ourselves of it. We have to... We have to we have to pray, we have to confess, we have to repent, we have to seek God's wisdom, we have to get into the word. You have to do something, connect with something spiritual, because if you leave yourself to your own devices, well, when we get time, tell me a story of when you really messed something up in your life, because we can all tell that story. And that's what happens when you get in your own devices. Eventually, our mind is unencumbered, but it's not because we thought positively enough. It's not just because we decided, you know what? I'm going to be positive today. It's a great thing to feed your mind positivity, but we can't just wake up and say, you know what? I'm not going to be down today. But what we can do, because Satan is a legalist, what we can do is not give him permission to be there. The only reason... The enemy is messing with our man. <laughs> it's because we let him. How silly is that? Some of you are like, no, I don't let him. I don't want him there. Eh, you may not want him there, but what are you doing to keep him out? I don't want ants in the summertime. But I can't just dump sugar all over the floor and be like, I don't want ants. They're not going to come. You got to take some preventative measures, like burn your house down. No, you take preventative measures. There's things you can put around the outside of your house. There's sprays you can put out. You, you can make sure the food's not left out and things that, you know, things that you do during the winter you can't do during the same during the summer because other things, there's other risks. So every season has a different remedy. What helps you in one season isn't going to help you in another. I can't do the same things to my house in the winter that I do during the summer. It will not be comfortable. It will not be inhabitable. We can't do the same things to our mind in one season that we did in another because it won't be comfortable. It won't be inhabitable. You won't want to be there. And you know what you do when you don't want to be there? You numb it. You go take a drink or 20. You go do some drugs you start watching pornography. You do anything you can to take your mind from in here and put it out there. Because every season has a different remedy. But you know where all the remedies are found? In right relationship with God. Step three. Replace self-focused thinking with a God-focused mindset. 
When we unwrap our heads that everything that's happening is not happening to us, it's happening because of us, we will make it a lot further. After praying for the Lord to protect your mind and recognizing the enemy, then we have a choice. We train ourselves to concentrate on the right things. We focus our mind on God, and man, does that require some work sometimes, because the moment that you've already opened that door and you've already invited the enemy in, and some of us didn't just invite him in, we actually gave him the nice padded chair in the room, we built a fire, we made him some snacks, we're like, hey, make yourself a home. Want to stay the night? I got an extra room. You can stick around. Some of that's really uncomfortable. Anybody here ever have a roommate that you're just like, hey, buddy, you, you need to stay somewhere for a couple nights or you can come sleep on my couch. And then like six months later, you're like, do you live here now? Your kids don't count, sorry. <laughs> if you've never had one of those unwanted roommates, take a long look, make sure you haven't been that unwanted roommate. But then when you go to try to ask them to leave, you've done them a favor, but when you ask them to leave, it's like, how dare you? What do you mean I have to leave? I was that guy once. I had a roommate, and he just, it was a friend of mine. He was like, man, I just need a place to stay for a couple nights. Eight months later, it was a couple. I guess a couple is arbitrary. I should have been more specific. And when I asked him to leave, it was like, how could you? What am I supposed to do? I don't know, pay rent. But I'm that nice guy. I'm like, well, I mean, you can stay, but you got to start paying rent. <laughs> pay rent. What do you mean pay rent? Well, I mean, like all the money that I spend every month to make sure that the license, can you help with that? I don't have the money for that. Okay. And I let it slide. And he stayed. We don't speak to each other to this day. Great friend of mine for many years. We still don't speak to this day because finally I had enough. How many of us have got that comfortable with the enemy in our head where now we don't even know how to detach ourselves from where it is because we've made provision for him to be there for so long that we're almost comfortable with his presence. We don't want to admit it, but we wouldn't know what to do without that inner turmoil. We don't want to think about it because as long as we have it, you know what we are? We're a victim. You know what victims get? Sympathy. Forgiveness. Leeway. Ooh, be careful with them. They're going through a spell, man. They're a victim. I don't know about you, but nowhere in the Bible does it tell me to be a victim. It tells me I'm an overcomer. I don't want to be a victim anymore. I especially don't want to be a victim of my own circumstance. You know, no one can victimize you. Only you can. You're the only one that makes you a victim. You get to choose how you respond to that situation. People can harm you. They can hurt you. If I threw this at you, it might hurt you. It might harm you. But I cannot victimize you. Only you get to choose that mindset if you desire. If not, if you set your things, if you set apart, set your mind to the things above, you are no longer a victim. You are an overcomer. These are just things that are happening because of me. Why are these things happening? Well, because I'm doing a good work and the enemy's decided he wants to throw things my way. But guess what, devil? I'm stronger than you and so is my God. So back off. And while you're at it, pack your bags, get out of my house. We replace self-focused thinking with a God-focused mindset. Step four, we rest in the truth that you are accepted in Jesus Christ. We pray for the Lord to protect our mind. We recognize the enemy. We work to keep a God-focused mindset. We kick him out of his apartment. We don't let him in there anymore. And over time, it becomes clearer then we can rest in the truth of who we are in Jesus. That we are adopted, we are grafted in. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are at peace. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ we are free from accusation. There <laughs> in Christ we are children of God and heirs along with Jesus. 
Some of us, that's all we really wanted. We just want to be someone's, we just want a mommy and a daddy. Remember back zero to four, five to eight, nine to 18, some of the things are programmed in us. We grew up without a mom, we grew up without a dad, we grew up in an abusive household. We grew up in a great household. We went to church every Sunday. Mom and dad loved each other. How come I still hurt? Because you're worn in a bubble, because you still went to school, because you still watch things on TV. Nowadays it's YouTube or whatever else that they, I mean, there's a million different ways that things are getting fed in. There is there not, there is therefore no, no, there is therefore now no, did Dr. Seuss write this book? There is therefore no, now, it's Romans 8, 1, read it for yourself. I can't, apparently. My identity in Jesus is the central fact that influences my life every day. Do not doubt, do not wonder, do not question it, accept God's gracious gift and rest in it. You know what step five is for renewing your mind? Repeat steps one through four every day. Not just when you need it, not just when you're down, every day. You wake up, go to step one, repeat them all. You know what, sometimes you might have to run through the list five or six times during a day, but that's okay. Ultimately, God wants us to be transformed. Jesus didn't engage in the type of mental you know, mechanics that, mechanics that we, we talked about here. He didn't need to. He was totally focused on the will of the Father, and because that was true of him, it will increasingly be true of me because I have accepted him inside of me. I have taken away the provision for anything else to be in my heart or my headspace, and I have only left room for the Holy Spirit. So every day we work closer to being like Christ. We work to be Christians, Christ-like. Because the truth is, folks, you can be a Christian and still be a bad person. Go to church every Sunday. You can do everything right. You can pay your tithes. You can stand up and sing during worship. Heck, you might even get bold and raise a hand or two. Woo! But yet you leave here and you're like, man, I'm distant from God. I didn't feel anything. I went in there and pretended really well, but I didn't feel anything. Most of the time when you feel that way, maybe I'm the only one, but, but I feel uneasy. I feel restless, like something's not setting, like it's not settled. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me all who are weary and labor. Everybody knows that one. But the first three words, come to me, come to me. When you're tired, he says, come to me. And this is Jesus speaking. When you're weary, come to me. When the burden of this world is too much, come to me. Not go to Facebook. Not go to your friends. Not go to social media. Not go to the TV. Not go to food. Not go to drugs. Not go to alcohol. Come to me. Folks, it doesn't even say, come to church. You'll find rest. You won't find rest in here. Hopefully what you'll find in here is Jesus. And when you find Jesus, you'll find rest. His word tells us that. In 1980, there was a, a band called the Eurythmics. Sweet dreams are made of cheese. All right, I know it's not cheese. It's these. We don't know what these are, but these are not cheese. But who am I to disagree? Um, sorry. It is one of, on a list of misquoted songs, it is number six. Number six, I Googled it because I needed to know. Um, number six, most misquoted song ever. But what's funny is people will still sing that with confidence, man. Sweet dreams are made of cheese. Cheese? What's wrong with you? 
Nobody's sweet dreams is cheese. Well, I like cheese. Well, you're weird. But the thing is, they sing it with confidence. Why? Because that's how they learned it. They learned it wrong, so they sing it wrong. So they live it wrong. This happens in our walk with Christ. We learn it wrong, zero to four. We live it wrong, five to eight. And now we act it wrong, nine to 18. We don't even know it. It was out of our control. We're stuck in these self-defeating cycles and people start thinking, you know, like, oh, I've been bound by this before, so I'm going to be bound by it again. I'm going to be stuck here. I'm forced to live just fighting this fight over and over. The Bible clearly says he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I mean, I don't know about you, but I believe what it says. And there's still folks fighting things that they don't even know what they're fighting. They don't even know why they're fighting it. They don't even know where it started. They're just swinging away in the dark at something. And they're holding on to things that they realize they don't even have a hold of. We're holding on to things that we don't even know we have a hold of. You know, when you have that sin, you know, that one thing, one thing that, that, that you don't even talk to God about? You know that one thing where you look at Jesus and you're like, you know that thing you did on the cross? It was great and all for everything else, but not for this. Well, you don't tell him that? When you pray, you don't, you don't talk, you, that's not what you say? But it doesn't matter because that's what your actions are saying, that's what your heart's saying. I don't care what your lips are saying. What your heart is saying is, God, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, except for this one, because this one's too big. I'm not going to give it to you. Jesus, you did a great thing, but it wasn't quite good enough for all of it. So that one thing that you're holding on to every time you think about it, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about sitting at the foot of the cross, looking up at Jesus in the moment of the crucifixion and saying, Jesus, thank you. But there's this one thing that I'm going to go ahead and put in my pocket. I'm going to go, I'm going to go stand back here in the back because what you're doing is not good enough for me. Folks, we're crucifying ourselves between two thieves. The regret of yesterday and the fear of tomorrow. That cross was already taken for us. We don't need to put ourselves on it. Fear and faith both require us to choose something we cannot see. How are you going to pick? So that was inward. Now we're going to talk about how all of that needs to affect how everything that me and God do needs to affect what you see. Easiest way to talk about transformation, and I'm sure you've all heard this analogy, is a butterfly. A butterfly doesn't always start out as a pretty little butterfly. It's an ugly little inchworm. Boop, boop, boop. Crawling along a branch. I'm not a scientist again, but I don't know if the butterfly gets bored. Or what happens? It's like, you know what? I need a sleeping bag. Makes a cocoon, hangs out for a little bit, takes a nap. My wife must be a butterfly. When it comes out, it's completely different. Completely different. I mean, it's one thing to like, I can run back there and I can change clothes when I come out. You're going to know who I am still. I might look a little different, but you're going to know who I am. A caterpillar goes in, furry little bug comes out a beautiful butterfly. That's a transformation. It has gone to somewhere where it cannot go back anymore. Other words for transformation, and it's really cool, it's conversion, metamorphosis, renewal, revolution. R renewal, whoa, renewal. Shifting, about face, changeover, transfiguration, a radical change. How many have heard that term on a Sunday morning? We need a radical change in here. We need a radical move in the spirit. It's all transformation. They're all telling us the same thing. We need to go somewhere else that we can't come back to where we are right now. Many people are fearful of change, both the expected and the unexpected. They need to experience things in order to live life with greater freedom and happiness. 
like an acorn that has to die to become an oak tree. Sometimes what we are now has to be put down to never come back to go be what God's called us to be. We can't have a foot in both ponds. We can't be in both places at once. We are not omnipresent. We are not God. We are in the midst of being transformed. We can become more compassionate, more caring, people who actually utilize these unique gifts and talents that God gave us. And we change the inward, our character and our integrity come along with it. Transformation literally means, at the root of the word, going beyond your form. To go beyond your form. To move past your current situation and do something. I'm going to go beyond this and I'm not coming back. But nothing will happen in our lives until the pain of remaining the same outweighs the fear of change. You cannot transform anything until the pain of remaining the same outweighs the change of fear. I read that and it was like, wow, that's good. I'm writing that down. And then I think of the little butterfly and the caterpillar analogy and I'm like, the caterpillar like crawling along. It's like, you know what? I'm getting splinters in my belly and I'm done with this pain. I'm going to go climb in a sleeping bag. I'm going to come out and I'm going to be able to fly. I'll never get another splinter in my belly again. Now all of a sudden it makes sense. I don't know if they get splinters in their belly. I'm not a scientist, guys. But wherever our, our mind goes, our character and integrity will follow. And those are the two most important outward traits that you can, you can show to anybody. What does your character and your integrity say about you? Because, folks, you know what? Talents and abilities, they can get you to the top. But your character and your integrity, that's what's going to keep you there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. We're going to read it very quickly. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God... <clears throat> was reconciling the word to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. We're running out of time. <laughs> Dang it. Because there was like three whole chapters in Colossians we needed to read. Well, not we. Um, read the end of chapter 2, all of chapter 3, and the beginning of chapter 4. And I'm going to kind of skip over it. Not skip it, but middle to the end of, of, of Colossians chapter 2. Verse 6 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted up, built up in him, and established in faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. It goes on. Where is it? Verse 11, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh and the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through, the, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, I want to I touch on that. Circumcised, remember, don't just think boy surgery when baby, no, think circumcised means to remove something that is unneeded. And, and it's very, very, there, there's this little part here with a circumcision made without hands. A, a removal of things that you don't need without hands. Why was it done without hands? Because God did it in our minds. Because we removed, we set ourselves apart from something. It wasn't a physical, this is a, a, a mental and a spiritual thing that is going to then affect the physical, but it was a circumcision done without hands. And I think that is, a, that is such a key little piece that, that we just read right over Verse 16, let, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or regard to a festival or a new moon and Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, verse 18, insisting on ascetism and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast ahead, from whom the whole body, nursed and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with what is from God. 
In Colossians chapter 3, it talks about putting on a new self. If you've been raised with Christ, it says, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, your life was hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Then it gets serious. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, on account these things of the wrath of God is coming. But now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Put on a new self which is being renewed in, in knowledge. I mean, you keep going through and it keeps telling us, put on then as God shows one. It keeps saying put on. Put on. Put on. Remember the, the armor of God. It's telling us, it keeps saying, put on. Put it on. Reclothe yourself. Here's a new wardrobe. You can take those and you can burn them and you can throw them away. You can, you can put this old wardrobe to death because I got something that's much more classy. It's much more stylish. The ladies are going to love it. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, bearing with one another. You know what another good word for bearing with one another is? Put up with each other. You don't have to like me. You don't have to like the fact that I refuse to shave. You don't have to like the style of music we play. But put up with one another. It's biblical. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Oh, dang. I'm supposed to forgive too. I got to put up with you and forgive you. See, the thing is, is that's, that, that, that's the problem with churches is, is we, get this, we get this mindset change. We, we think that we're, oh, we're renewed in the mind. And then we look around and we're like, well, my physical doesn't like it here. I'm going to leave. Oh, I don't want to see anybody leave our church, but more than that, I don't want to see anybody leave our church, I don't want to see anybody leave the church. See, the funny thing is, is, is a few of us, this is, you know, the first church you've ever gone to in your life, but some of you went somewhere else. And so when we're critical of people leaving a church or anything like that, remember, you left somewhere to be here. So it's not about coming, it's not about going, it's not about leaving, it's not about staying. It's about the mindset while you're here. Are you, are you, bearing with the body of Christ? Are you truly bearing with the body of Christ? Are you, are you putting up with the body of Christ? Or are you going back to those habits that are non-transformable, that are just changes, and it's self-importance. It's a megalomaniac attitude. It's, it's I will do this as long as you do this. Those what-if statements, we, or those then statements, I'll do this, then you do this. You, forg you apologize, then I'll forgive you. You sing the worship songs I want, then I'll tithe more. No, you won't. If you start a, a knitting ministry, I, I, I'll invite all my friends. No, you won't. There is no ifs and thens. The truth is, is you are only going to be as invested as you want to be. And that outward difference will only come with a mindset change. And once you've changed that mindset, then you have to put into practice and do things and Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Put up with one another. Because we're not going to do everything perfect for everyone all the time. And that's not just coming from the stage towards the congregation or the congregation towards the stage. Look to your left. Look to your right. Those people are going to do you wrong too. Those people are going to let you down too. But are you going to bear with them or are you going to forgive them? Are we going to be a body of believers that raises one another up? Or are we going to be a social club that has status? And that if you don't meet my status, I can't associate with you. Rules for Christian households. This is a good one because verse 18, when I, before I ever really learned a whole lot about the Bible, I loved Colossians 3.18. Loved it. Wives, submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Boom. Done. And then I met Pastor Aaron, and he taught me this word, and I don't like this word anymore. It's called context. And read ahead, read behind. And it's like, I don't want to read ahead or behind because I've read it now, and I don't want to say it out loud. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So much for that. Children, obey your parents in everything you do. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Bond servants, obey. Obey and serve. Obey and serve. 
bear with one another, put up with one another. It is this thing, it is a, a reoccurring thing. If we don't have an outward change, then nobody knows what's going on inside. If we don't have an outward change, there, hold on. If you walked in a store and you saw these two things on the shelf, which one are you going to go for? I'm going to go for these guys right here. Anybody who said anything different, you're a liar. Okay, so you don't like Oreos. Put a label here of a cookie you do like. I mean, nobody really sees this and is like, oh, yeah, a bag. <laughs> you see this, you're like, yeah, yeah. Give me a glass of milk, some good Netflix, a fork for those experienced dunkers that know how to do it without getting your fingers wet. I'm serious. the packaging that makes us want the content. I mean, we're being honest here. If these were setting up here and I told you you could come choose one, most of us, some of us are weird, are going to walk up and pick this up. What if this was filled with cash? Yeah. We would have never known. We would have never gave it a chance. Why? Packaging makes us want the contents. What does the packaging say about you? As we prepare to close today, I want us to think about, let's, let's, let's think about that. What? There's a packaging that is attractive. But far too often, we don't want to acknowledge the outside of our church what the grounds look like, what, what we look like, talk like, act like, smell like, think like, respond to people like, that package means something. You know what I hear that frustrates me? Just let God do a move and lives will be changed. No, 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 no. Because see, the people who we want to reach, oh God, they know you. The people we want to reach, they've never met Jesus. They've met you. When they meet you, does that make them want to meet Jesus? Is our package, is our, our labeling, is our exterior, Make people want to know what's inside. It's time that we have a metamorphosis, that we stop thinking in, in old mannerisms. I mean, the truth is, folks, it's not just here, it's with every church. It's like this week, if you look around, Pastor's out of town, 30% of the congregation doesn't show up. So for those that are here, my question, it's really simple. Is your relationship, is your faith founded on Jesus, or is it founded on a person? It's not just our church. It's all over the place. I've talked to other pastor friends around town. They say the same thing, because it's always bothered me. I'm newer at this. It's always bothered me. But I found out it's just a thing. Man, it's a thing that I don't like. I'm going to be real. I don't like it. I love Pastor Aaron. I love Pastor Christy. I love these people that we have that I get to serve with that have helped cultivate the gifts inside of me. But the truth is, is that if that's the only reason I continue to come here and serve, then I am not walking obedient to God. If the only reason that you walk through those doors is all depending on who's going to stand on this stage and hold this microphone, you are doing it wrong. 
Do you understand that you're doing it wrong? It's not about a relationship with church. It's about a relationship with God. And he can do this through any one of you holding one of these just like he's doing right now. It's not me. It's not Josh. It's not Monty. It's not Aaron. It's God. And when we come to this place looking for a relationship with God, setting our mind apart from what the world has and letting our actions back that up because we are going to have a good appeal to the people that don't know Christ because they don't know him, but they know me. And when they see me, do they see a Christian or do they see a person that goes to church? I really hope that I'm a Christian influence on people and not a church influence on people. I hope when people see me that they want to get to know Christ, not want to go to some social club that meets on the Sunday morning for an hour and a half. Colossians 3, verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Because at the end of all of that, the question you're always going to have to ask is why? Why? Why change? I don't mind who I am. Why change? It's hard, it's difficult. You don't know what I've been through. You're right, I don't. But I know what I've been through. Is it as bad as what you've been through? Yes. I don't care what you've been through. Mine's just as bad. You know why? Because it separated me from Christ. Yours may have had more trauma. There might be longer and deeper scars. But mine was just as bad because it pulled me away from right relationship with God. And I never had to walk through addiction. I've never had to, to suffer through the trauma of abuse. I haven't, folks. And I pray, and I'm sorry, and my heart bleeds for anyone who has. But you know what? We serve a God who can heal us. We serve a God who can deliver us. We serve a God who can transform us. Why? Why do it? Because we will receive the inheritance as our reward. I love the people I get to serve with. And that's not just the staff, that's all of you. And my reward is the inheritance of the kingdom. You know what I look forward to the most of that reward? Getting to do this with all of you forever. Find your reward. Live in it. Dwell on it. You want to change yourself? Change your mind. Change your mind. Allow your mind to then dictate what you do. Don't fall into the habits and the tricks of change. Don't, don't go through these moments where it's like, oh, been clean for, for six months. I haven't, oh, I haven't hit my wife in a year. Oh, I haven't cheated on my husband in, in three years now. It, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit when you talk to someone and they're like, you introduce yourself to them and they're like, yeah, my name is, huh, I'm an alcoholic. Oh man, I'm sorry. I hope you're getting, getting that right. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm in Celebrate Recovery. But you're clean? Yeah, I've been clean. How long have you been clean? 32 years. What? When are you going to release yourself from prison? And I'm not saying bad things about recovery. Please do not take this as saying bad things about recovery. But sometimes we get addicted to recovery. 
Or sometimes we take away the drugs and the alcohol and we put things like food or TV or women. Or, no, that's a bad one. Um, our wives. We're addicted to our wives. That's still, that's not bad either. Um, can't think of any more. Um, you get the point. Truth is, drugs aren't the only thing that can kill us. Just like when I can look at you and confidently say, I don't care what you've been through, mine's just as bad. You know why? It separated me from Christ. So it doesn't matter what your addiction is, what your sin is, what your moment is. Jesus hung on one cross for all the sins, not just for all of them, except for yours because yours is special. No, it's not. He hung on the cross for yours too. Quit trying to pull him off of it and put yourself on it. Because you're not big enough for that. You can't fill that role. But the same thing with our mind is we start to change. We're like, I'm over here. I don't want to go back over there. I'm over here. I don't want to go back over there. I'm over here, but I don't want to go back over there. I'm over here. Why? Why do we find ourselves drifting back to the same things? Because we never take our mind off of it. At some point, I said, we have to release ourselves from the prison that was and learn that we have a life to be. And that's when we've transformed. That's when we've had a total metamorphosis. That is when step eight is done and ugly little worm is no longer inching along, barely trying to scratch by on life and afraid of everything in the world. All of a sudden we have wings. We are free because he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I am free. I can fly. I can soar. I can reach the heavens because you know what? That's where my God is. I can go up and I can give him a high five because, hey, you know what? We have that kind of relationship. Why? Because... I've put away everything else and I've set myself apart. Folks, I just encourage you this morning, don't have one without the other. You can't change the outward without changing the inward. And if you don't change the inward correctly, everything that the outward speaks of is going to be the brown bag special. And you're better than the brown bag special. God's better than the brown bag special. Michelle loves the brown bag special. <laughs> it is legitimately trash for those wondering. It is wadded up paper to make it stand up, which it still didn't do. Um, it had one job. And it failed at that one. All the more reason these are better. They'll do their job every time. They're multifaceting. They will give you comfort. They are milk absorbers. They will help you gain weight. They'll affect your diabetes. No, Oreos are not. Things like that are bad. I mean, that's just two chocolate mistakes sandwiched around regret. That's what that is. We set our minds to things that, that we want to do. The truth is, is everything that happens up here, that's our conscious mind. Our subconscious is what goes on in here. You don't have to tell your heart to beat. You don't have to tell your lungs to breathe. It kind of just does it. I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is kind of like, it's kind of like Aladdin. Our bodies are kind of like the genies. Whatever our mind decides to really, really think of, the body kind of goes, your wish is my command. And it kind of just does it. I mean, we've all been there. You may not even realize you have, but you've been there. You've been there where you're like, you know what? I really want this. I want this job. So you say you want this job, and then pretty soon you start having these weird like moments where you're at that place of business to talk to someone. Oh, I didn't know I was even coming here. Or you just start gravitating your mind towards making yourself appealing for whatever that position is. When your mind thinks something, your subconscious will go there, will help you achieve it, because your wish is my command. If we want to be transformed and we start with here, when our mind achieves it and believes it, it will help the rest of this walk it out.
kept you guys entirely too long today. Thank you for bearing with me. What happens when I only get to do this like once every six months? I'm going to talk forever. You're stuck with me. Thank you. Um, so we're going to close now. There's so much more. But it's one o'clock in the afternoon, right? I think it's, please tell me they set that clock forward. If it was two, I was going to be mad at me. Tells brown bagging me again. All right. So how we're going to close today? We're going to transform ourselves in another way because one thing that that once we transform our mind and, and we and we want to to have our actions follow that. You know what we're going to do more? We're going to read our Bible more. We're done. You know what else we're going to do? We're going to find. We're going to intentionally fellowship with one another more. We're going to pray more. Except for Marlene. I don't know if that's possible. We are going to pray more. Everybody stand with me. If we have any prayer team members, I would like you to come to the front. And here's how we're going to pray today. Instead of this, this awkward altar call where you get to decide, if you want prayer for individual things, we're going we're gonna to do this a little different. I'm going to bring the prayer team forward because I'm going to pray for the prayer team. Because guess what? They need prayer too. Yeah. So earlier we asked, who needs change? Did that change anybody's mind? Oh, some of you got it. Who needs transformation? There we go. Who needs transformation of, of, of mindset? Come forward. Step out. Be bold. We're going to change your mind one step at a time. The first one is we're going to be bold. Who needs a physical transformation? Like, I know that the things that I think and the things that I do don't exactly run in the same vein. They, they kind of go, woo. It's like a drunken clown. Stumbling around. Come forward. We're going to pray for you too. See, the great thing about it is, is, is every week we have an opportunity to do this right here and come to this altar and lay things down to our King Jesus. But once again, we get in that mindset of, you know what? My thing's too big to pray about. Or maybe my thing's not big enough. Man, those people up there, they got some real problems. And I don't know if I, I just don't, I don't want people to think I have that kind of problem too. Guess what? Most of us that see you sitting in the seats think, you got a big problem. Because you're not up here. Because you don't want to admit it to yourself that you need this. You're the one with the problem back there. When you sit there, and it's written all over your face, because your face is like all over the place. Like, man, I know you're, you're itching in your seat. You're jumping around. You're about to like climb on top of the rafters and swing. I mean, you just want to get out of your seat so bad, but you can't because, oh, the enemy, he's talking to you because you, you gave him that chair. You just poured him a fresh cup of coffee, and now he's got a minute of your time, and he's going to tell you, you know what? Your sin is too big for prayer. They can't help you. You know what? Your sin's not as important as those up there. Yeah, go ahead. Go up there. Go up there and get prayer. Look like a fool in front of everyone. Please do. If I, can, if I can heal from something, if I can leave something here today and it makes me look like a fool, then a fool I shall be. I want to pray for all of us. I mean, you saw who the prayer team was. If you have an individual prayer need, I do not want to discourage that today. If you're in this place and you don't have a right relationship with God or you haven't even accepted, you're still that person that's like, I don't know this guy, I just know you guys. Well, hopefully today, knowing us will help you get a relationship with him. If that's you today, when we're done praying, I want you to go see Marlene. If you're ready to take that commitment and say, you know what, God, these crazy people around here, these are just my kind of crazy. I need it on this. Then I need you to go see Marlene.
If you have other prayer requests, please find someone to pray with individually. But as a whole, we're going to pray for transformation. We're going to pray that, that when we walk out of here, the caterpillars get to stay in here and the butterflies are going to walk out. Men, we get to be butterflies today. It's okay. Flap your wings. Flap your wings, guys. It's okay. We're going to be beautiful little butterflies. Why? Because it's okay for us to transform too. It's okay for guys to put down ugly things and become beautiful in Christ. There's no machismo in Christ. Every head bowed and every eye closed in this place this morning. Lord God, we, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we just, we pray and we lay before you and we give to you this morning everything that we thought we needed to hold on to. Lord, these things that we learned from when we were little to when we were big, these things do not define us, Lord. We, we, set, them, we set them down. God, this morning, we give to you our addictions. We give to you our hangups. We give to you our, our social inadequacies. We give to you our, our job problems, our relationship problems, our family problems. Lord, we, we give it all to you. Because, God, we want a renewed mind. We want a changed mind. Lord, not only that, we ask that, that this new mindset, that, Lord, that we could walk it out, that, that when people meet us, they see you. But God, it's not about these that are standing around us right now, but, Lord, we know that those that we encounter out, outside of this building, those that we truly need to go talk to, those that we truly need to reach out to, that they don't know you, but, Lord, they know us. God, they've never met you, but they've met us. So, Lord, in this moment, we pray and, and we, we just ask that our words, our actions, our thoughts, our daily lives, how, how we are, it would line up with who you are. Not, Lord, not, just, not just the things that we say to people when the moment presents itself, but, Lord, the things that we do behind the scenes. Lord, how we treat our families. God, the type of father that I am. I, I pray that I am a godly father. Lord, I pray that, that I'm a husband, that I... That I'm a husband that represents you in my household. Lord, I pray that, that I'm, a, I'm a pastor that shepherds the way that you would shepherd your church. That, Lord, I'm a friend that's as loyal as you would be to yours. That, God, that I'm a man of Christ. That I can be the very best man of Christ that I can be. I can be everything that you made me to be. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We're not proud this morning. We're not, we're not perfect. This morning we stand here, we approached this altar in boldness saying, guess what, God? We're broken, we're messed up, we're confused, we're sideways, but you can fix us. You can fix us. Because, because Lord, you can set us free. And he who the sun sets free is? Because he who the sun sets free is? Because he, come on, are you free? Or are, you, are you like, oh, it's free, free, he's free indeed. <laughs> he who the sun sets free is? Free Thank you. I mean, you, you almost sound like you wanted to be free. <laughs> amen and amen. If you need prayer this morning, please, this is... This place is going to be left. If you have conversation, if you have things that you want to do and you want to fellowship, we encourage it. We have a fellowship cafe and we have a foyer. Let's please take that out there because this morning, this altar, this sanctuary is going to remain a safe place for those who have some things that they need to leave at the altar. And we are not going to interrupt that this morning. Amen. Thank you guys so much. by faithful monthly contributions from viewers like you. Please take time today and make your tax-deductible gift to Crossfire World Outreach Ministries, 942 28th Street, Springfield, Oregon, 97477, 541-686-3473, or find us on the web at mycrossfire.com.